This is the Wednesday, November 16th, 2022 afternoon session of the Portland City Council. Hello, Megan. Could you please call the roll? Maps? Here. Rubio? Here. Ryan? Here. Hardesty? Here. Wheeler? Here. Before we get to our legal counsel, we have a very special guest in the chamber today. Colleagues, I'd like to welcome Governor-elect Tina Kotek to come up and just say a few words. Good afternoon, Governor. Thank you so much for dropping in today. We appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and 
Members of the Commission, it's so nice to see you. Um, for the record, I'm Tina Kotek, Governor-elect of the State of Oregon. Well, soon to be. It's not official yet, but um, thank you for your gracious invitation to just come by and say hello. First of all, I want to thank you for your service. We all have a lot of things we need to take on as, as public servants. And I'm meeting with the mayor today and some of his team to talk about some of the priorities here in the city. What I've said on the campaign trail is that it is important for Portland to thrive. It's important for Portland to be successful and safe and a place where everyone can be successful. And we have challenges here. We all know what those are. But my hope is to have a strong working relationship with the leadership here in the city of Portland so we can take our, our housing and homelessness challenge, our issues around mental health and addiction, making sure our schools can be successful, and also making sure that the entire state knows that we are one state, we have to work together. And I have heard across the state that people are concerned about things in Portland. We have work to do, but we're gonna do it together. And I really appreciate the opportunity to say hello and, and just thank you for everything you're doing and I'm optimistic we can solve problems together. Thank you, Governor-elect Kotek. And I just wanna say, colleagues, uh, the Governor-elect will be meeting with me every two weeks. Uh, she has prioritized the same things that this council has prioritized, homelessness, public safety, making sure that our city recovers fully and quickly. And I was very energized by the conversation that she had with my uh, staff and with me earlier today. In fact, uh, I believe you're actually gonna go up and continue to talk to them because there were other issues that she wanted to raise. But we really appreciate your attention to the city of Portland and the work that we're doing here at City Hall. And we wish you the very best as you take office on January 1st. Thank you for everything you're Thank doing. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. Yeah. Good to see you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Now we'll hear from legal counsel on the rules of order and decorum. <laughs> Follow that. I'll do my best, Mayor. <laughs> Good afternoon. Welcome to the Portland City Council. City Council is holding hybrid public meetings with in-person attendance in addition to electronic attendance. If you wish to testify before council in person or virtually, you must sign up in advance by visiting the council agenda on the council clerk's webpage at www.portland.gov slash council slash agenda. You may sign up for communications to briefly speak about any subject. You may also sign up for public testimony and resolutions, reports, or the first readings of ordinances. Written testimony may be submitted at cctestimony at portlandoregon.gov. Your testimony should address the matter being considered at the time. When testifying, please state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Please disclose if you are a lobbyist. If you are representing an organization, please identify it. For testifiers joining virtually, please unmute yourselves once the council clerk calls your name. The presiding officer preserves order and decorum during city council meetings to everyone so everyone can feel welcome, comfortable, respected, and safe. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. A timer will indicate when your time is done. Disruptive conduct such as shouting, refusing to conclude your testimony when your time is up, or interrupting others' testimony or council deliberations will not be allowed. If there are disruptions, a warning will be given that further disruption may result in the person being ejected for the remainder of the meeting. After being ejected, a person who fails to leave the meeting is subject to arrest for trespass. Additionally, council may take a short recess and reconvene virtually. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. We have one very important item for this afternoon, 978, a non-emergency ordinance. Amend Motor Vehicle Fuels Code to increase the minimum content requirements for biofuels and add a carbon intensity standard to ensure lowest carbon fuels are sold in the City of Portland. Thank you. Colleagues, this is a hearing of the Portland City Council. Today's date is November 16th, 2022. Good afternoon, everyone. We're here today to discuss a proposal from the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability related to the use of renewal renewable diesel fuels in Portland. This is a first reading of this item. We'll hear a presentation from staff, take public testimony on the proposal, and then have time, uh, as always, for council questions and discussion. There is not a vote on this today. We'll discuss next steps after the public testimony. I look forward to hearing more about the proposal from the team. Commissioner Rubio, would you like to introduce this item and our presenters? Thank you, Mayor. 
Uh, colleagues, so you've heard me say a number of times that we need to take accelerated action when it comes to climate change. And what I present to you today is bold and necessary action to reduce the fourth largest source of carbon emissions in Portland. It's been a long time in the making, but first some history. Portland was the first city to pass a renewable fuel standard, or RFS, in 2006. Since then, the RFS has been successful in accelerating the development of biodiesel and ethanol in Oregon. The RFS not only has helped to grow these industries, it supported feed feedstock production and biofuel production in state and expanded access to these fuels at retail stations. In other words, the first time we did this, it worked. It was an effective and transformative policy move. In fact, Portland's RFS was so successful that in April 2011, Oregon adopted the same standard statewide, implementing B5, a 5% biodiesel blend. Since that time, there have been many advancements in fuel technologies and markets, and that's why City Council directed BPS to update the RFS. What we are presenting here is a critically important step in our transition away from fossil fuels and toward decarbonizing our transportation sector. The RFS is also a human health policy since it directly addresses a major source of diesel particulate matter and will have benefits for Portlanders by cleaning up the air that we breathe. I want to acknowledge all the helpful and insightful comments that the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability received during the public comment period. And you'll hear more about all of this during the staff presentation and invited testimony. But I would like to address a few of the themes we heard up front. First, while we continue to hear from renewable fuel producers that supply will be available in Oregon by 2026, we have adjusted the rollout timeline to respond to concerns from local industry about supply and cost. The proposal extends the phase-in schedule out to 2030. We also heard concerns of fuel retailers and distributors about supply, supply and cost. Our intent is not to burden local gas stations and truck stops. That is why we will stand up a technical advisory committee that will provide guidance and emerging data to shape policy implement, implementation. The Technical Advisory Committee, or TAC, will provide the BPS Director with market intelligence at regular intervals starting in 2024 through the policy's target goal of 2030. The TAC's charge will be to provide reports and make recommendations to the BPS Director in advance of each key compliance date. BPS, in turn, will report to City Council at the, at the dates specified in the ordinance. The other key item in this code update Generated, that generated significant interest is about the carbon intensity standard. The carbon intensity standard is the innovative heart of this code package and is an example of the reason why Portland continues to be a leader on climate actions. Carbon intensity is a term used to describe how much carbon a particular fuel emits per unit of energy. Setting a carbon intensity standard is essential to ensuring that we can compare fuels in this emerging market and ensures Portland uses lower carbon renewable fuels that have lesser impacts on upstream communities and on the environment. We have proposed a CI standard of 40, which reflects the best available data of supply today and the available supply forecasts from leading fuel distributors. But like the supply concern, the TAC will evaluate the CI standard and availability and will make recommendations to the BPS director. What we want the public and interested stakeholders to know is that the rulemaking process and the interim rule authority in the code both provide flexibility and nimbleness needed to adjust the policy based on real market conditions. And finally, I want to be clear that BPS and I share a commitment and a vision with our community partners of a transportation system that is completely free of fossil fuels and non-reliant on internal combustion en engines. We also know that current, current science and data tells us that that future that we are all working hard to realize is still one to two decades out, especially for heavy duty vehicle, vehicles that run on diesel. So that's why this move today is important. We have to do all we can when we can. And in other words, I'm asking you to join me in taking bold and nimble action in the face of climate change. We must achieve our target of a 50% emissions reduction by 2030, and this policy is a significant step in meeting that goal. It also has the potential to significantly improve air quality in the short term. 
I also want to mention that earlier today, council offices received a memo outlining an administrative amendment to the ordinance that changes key reporting dates to reflect the timeline change staff made to the code in response to stakeholder feedback. So I will be introducing that amendment after testimony is heard. Finally, before we move into the presentation, I just want to say how appreciative I am of the great work of Director Donnie, Donnie Oliveira, Andrea Jacob, Kyle Deisner, and Pam Nailed, and, and the rest of the team that they've all put into this multi-year project. We are very excited to present to you all today the product of all this work. So I will now turn it over to BPS Director Donnie Oliveira to kick off the staff presentation. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio. Clerk, we have the, the deck queued up, thank you. Mayor Wheeler, Commissioner Ryan, Commissioner Hardesty, Commissioner Maps, thank you so much for having us here. Daniel Oliveira for the record, Director of Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. I want to first start by acknowledging that you all have been uh, immense, uh, immersed in incredibly complicated uh, issues over the last several months since the last time we connected on climate. And I want to just thank you for your service as elect, uh, Governor-elect uh, Tina Kotek did as well. But I also want to take a moment to acknowledge that this is also a significant moment for you as we tackle climate change. Earlier this summer, you took uh, bold steps to reset the city's climate goals and objectives to ensure that we are on track to meet the emergency in front of us today. And today is the first policy that we're bringing to you that is gonna actually reduce emissions in Portland. So we're done with the planning as we talked about in July, we're getting into action. But this isn't a policy out of left field. As Commissioner Rubio alluded to, this has been a policy many years in the making. Started in 2006 with the first RFS, um, market technologies and innovations have spurred opportunities in the marketplace, both in Portland and in Oregon. But frankly, this has been a lot of important work done by Bureau staff and our stakeholders to ensure that we have the right policy at the right time. We're leveraging good data, but key insights into what's next for our fuel market in Portland to ensure that we have a policy that's deliverable, but responsive to um, our stakeholders. I wanna take a moment to acknowledge the staff work that's gone into this, as you heard from Commissioner Rubio, and you'll hear um, from our invited guests and our, our testimony. We've had a lot of conversation over the past months, but going back the last several years, on what it looks like to develop a policy that's not just regulatory, but really shaping a market. We understand that there's a lot of concern about supply and cost when it comes to fuels in our system, and we hear that, and we're responsive to that by establishing flexibility within this policy to ensure that this council and our city can be responsive to the, the concerns that may arise over the next uh, several years with this policy. I wanna leave you with three things, though, as we, we approach this vote and you consider this uh, for the new standard for the city of Portland's renewable fuels. First, think about the what we're experiencing in the, in the climate emergency and our, the crisis that we're experiencing every day. This is an example of Portland's leadership in climate justice and climate action because it's signaling very clearly that we're not just talking about climate response, but we're actually doing something about it. Second, this is a transition policy. We have a lot of work to do in the transportation sector around transit, around multimodal transportation, and those are all good things. We're not giving up on it. But we have a chance to take action on something significant like diesel emissions. We should do it. The technology is saying that we can do it. Here we are today. And last, and this is equally as important, we want to be responsive to our partners in industry who are concerned about their own viability. We understand the challenges they're facing as the economic uncertainty continues to swirl around us. We hear them loud and clear, and we want to be at the table with them when we advance Portland's economy to a clean and just future that is fossil fuel free. So that's the kind of the pitch to you all up front before uh, my colleague uh, goes into the technical. But this is a real significant opportunity for this council to take bold climate action, to put, to put policy behind our values as a climate leader. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. My name is Andrea Jacob. For the record, I am the Program Manager for Climate Policy and Programs at the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. So we are here today to talk about the Renewable Fuel Standard, or RFS. It's city code that regulates the blending or mixing of fossil fuel with renewable fuels. It's been in effect since 2006, and it applies to both diesel and gasoline sold in retail locations throughout the city. Today's RFS requires a 5% minimum blend of biodiesel and a 10% blend of ethanol. The proposed code changes apply to diesel fuel sales only and do not ban the use of diesel fuel. P 
people will still be able to drive vehicles that use petroleum diesel in the city of Portland. The RFS does, however, change the composition of the fuel over time, which we will detail a little bit later. Next slide, please. So as you heard a little bit already, um, there are a couple reasons to update it now. Um, the, the code does not recognize renewable diesel. This fuel didn't even exist when we passed the original, when council adopted the original RFS in 2006. So technology and markets change. We need to recognize that. Um, I don't need to convince anyone here that we're in the climate emergency. And also to reiterate the point about community health. Um, diesel particulate matter is a air pollutant and there are, uh, because of historical um, injustices, uh, a lot of our communities of color are located near freeways and um, polluting infrastructure and bear the greatest brunt of the air pollution that comes when we combust diesel. I just want to say that there are limitations to what this code regulates. This proposal cannot solve all of our climate or community health needs and it is not without complexity. Um, we do agree that the future is all electric, as you've heard, but it's critical that we take steps today while tomorrow's transportation infrastructure is being built. Next slide, please. So at its core, the changes phase in higher blends of renewable fuels through 2030. The new standard will begin in 2024, and by 2030, it will replace 99% of petroleum diesel sold in the city with a blend of renewable diesel and biodiesel. And I have a chart in a little bit that um, will show that phase-in schedule a little bit more clearly. Um, a couple of things that the code also does, I'm going to speak about most of these later in the presentation, but just to sort of tick them off, um, it adds renewable diesel as an allowable fuel. It adds that carbon intensity standard, um, and we'll spend more time on that. Um, in response to industry, industry concerns about biodiesel, we did put a 20% cap for the purposes of compliance on biodiesel. We also added some exemptions for certain specific cases brought to us by stakeholders. Some of the penalties increased, just recognizing that it's not the same world as 2006. Um, we also clarified the rulemaking authority, which uh, was something recommended by the city attorney just to bring this code into conformance with other city codes. Next slide, please. So before we dig into the details about the policy, I just wanted to take a moment to review the basics. Uh, biofuels are any fuel that is derived from plant or animal matter rather than petroleum-based fuel sources. So I'm gonna use that ice cream metaphor again that I think I use with Commissioner Ryan. If you think of biofuels as ice cream and then you have different flavors, renewable diesel is a flavor and biodiesel is a flavor. So we use the term biofuels or renewable fuels interchangeably and when we're talking about the specific fuels, <laughs> we're talking about renewable diesel and biodiesel. Uh, renewable diesel is a really interesting fuel. Um, it is uh, chemically the same as petroleum diesel. It's considered a drop-in fuel and because of its ease and performance, it's well liked by fleets, including our own city fleet and TriMet, uh, both of whom you'll hear from a little bit later. Biodiesel is a different product. It's renewable, biodegradable. It's made from vegetable oils, animal fats, recycled restaurant grease. It, um, it is an example of a local uh, product, a circular economy type product, where a, a waste product is a feedstock for something else. And as I mentioned, the current RFS requires the 5% blend in every gallon of diesel fuel sold today. We are not proposing any changes to the ethanol component of the RFS. Not going to even talk about it. Um, and so why it matters, um, it's a big source of carbon emissions. It's a source of air pollution. Um, if you uh, look at our carbon analysis, it's the fourth largest source of local carbon emissions. And it's an exciting time because there is a lot of new renewable diesel product coming online. Next slide. So this is really um, at the heart of the code um, of the code changes is this phase in schedule. So the proposed standard for minimum biofuel content has been refined through consultation with stakeholders. There are really only three main compliance dates, one in 2024, 
in 2026 and 2050, and we consider the ones in 2026 and 2030 to be the real big jumps. Um, the, today, there is ample supply of biodiesel. We're currently at an 11% blend, even though the requirement is only 5%. A number of gas stations in Portland have already been blending diesel fuel with 20% biodiesel to reduce the cost at the pump. So we do not see a big jump to 15% in 2024. It's not a big leap and we're giving the market time from today till then to prepare for it. Um, given the available production forecast for renewable fuels, we do anticipate renewable fuels in Oregon by 2026 to meet that 50% standard and certainly plenty by uh, uh, by 2030 to meet that 99% standard. I'll talk about this a little bit later and you're also gonna hear about that from our invited panelists. Just to anticipate the question about why 99%, we do leave 1% petroleum diesel, so that allows for some federal blending tax credits. Next slide, please. So here's where we'll talk about the carbon intensity standard. Uh, this is really the big market signal that Portland is sending with this policy. Not all renewable fuels are created equal, and I'm gonna show you that in the next slide, but I just wanna take a minute to explain why carbon intensity is important. So the burning of any fuel has a climate impact, and there can be significant range in the climate impacts, even within the category of renewable diesel or biodiesel. And so because there's this variation, we need a standard way to measure life cycle carbon emissions, and a CI or a carbon intensity value is that, is that metric. And it's expressed in a scientific formula that might look a little daunting, um, but it's really expressed as a volume grams of carbon dioxide equivalent. And so that just means there's more greenhouse gases than just carbon dioxide. So we lump them together in this equivalent per unit of energy, which is a megajoule. I don't really know what a megajoule is, but it, it's okay. We, it's just a volume per unit of energy. So you're, what you're getting at is um, that the, the lower the CI, the less carbon it emits, and the higher the CI, the more carbon it emits. And because this is a measure of life cycle carbon emissions, it accounts for the emissions from every stage of that production. So whether it's from the feedstock, um, the production of it, so that accounts for all of the fuels that it's used to make and refine the product, and that can be renewable, that could be fossil, so that we need to account for that. There are land use impacts um, that if we switch agricultural land to, to make biofuel feedstock, there's accounts for that. How did it get to us? By rail, by barge, by truck, so we account for that, and then the combustion. So what the CI does, it uh, ensures that only the lowest carbon Biofuels with the lowest impacts are what we are attracting to our market here. Next slide, please. So I like this chart. Um, I think it's cool. It's called a violin chart, um, and I will talk us through it. So in general, what you are seeing is the range of approved life cycle carbon intensity values for all the fuels imported into Oregon from the state clean fuels program. So along the bottom axis, you have the range of carbon intensities from zero to 200. And the Y axis is the fuel type. And that vertical line in the middle is our proposed CI of 40. So the main focus of the RFS update is to phase out the sale of petroleum diesel fuel. And I'm showing you that in the red circle. So look for the red diesel on the left and then follow that red circle and you see that green dot, that has a carbon intensity of 100. So just that's your, what we're comparing to. Now, I'm showing, we're also showing you the two main fuels that we're replacing petroleum diesel with, renewable diesel at the top and biodiesel at the bottom. And so you can see in those ovals a lot of pink dots and a lot of green dots. And that means that renewable diesel has a variety of carbon intensities and so does biodiesel. And some of them are even as high as the same carbon intensity as petroleum diesel. So what you're seeing is that anything to the left of this line would be allowed and anything to the right of this line would not be allowed. So Environmental advocates and environmental justice communities have raised valid concerns about life cycle carbon emissions and especially the induced land use changes from that conversion of ag land to, 
to fuel feedstock. And so it, we also heard from stakeholders that, that, and you'll hear probably later, that this is too low of a carbon intensity standard and some stakeholders would like to see it higher. Because we are balancing that feedback from environmental and environmental justice communities as well as industry, we thought that the 40 was the place to start for code and then we can talk about definitions and all the specifics of implementation later in rulemaking. Next slide, please. So we have heard a lot of concerns about the supply of, of biofuels, in particular renewable diesel. So this is data from the Oregon Clean Fuels Program. This is supply that is available to come to Oregon. So it's showing 772 million gallons. Just for a point of reference, our consumption in Portland is 120 million gallons per year. So when we look out in uh, just a couple of years, I'm going to show you the fuel forecast for 2024. We're looking at 5 billion gallons coming online. Our usage is just 2.4% of that. So that's just a drop in the bucket. Next slide, please. These are data from the Energy Information Administration. And what it's showing is explosive growth nationally in, the re in renewable diesel production, increasing from a billion gallons this year uh, to 5 billion gallons per year by 2024. So even if some of what is proposed is delayed or doesn't come online, this growth shows that we're still well ahead of our 2030 target for R99. But because we understand uncertainty and forecast uh, nobody has a crystal ball, we're planning to manage that uncertainty through the Technical Advisory Committee, um, which will give us a line of sight into this market, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. So we are seeing growth. I also want to mention that you know, we are seeing growth in Oregon and Washington as well. But even if that doesn't come to pass, there's so much coming from other parts of the, of the country. And we would account for that in the CI standard. So that's the way that we ensure the fuels stay low carbon. Next slide, please. I'd say that the most common theme that we heard during public comment from local fuel retailers and distributors, as well as the freight and trucking interest during public comment, is that they all really like renewable diesel. This is a fuel that is very exciting to them, but they are concerned about the availability of it coming to Oregon and to Portland at a competitive price. And we understand the current market is admittedly constrained. We're not solving for today. We are looking four years and you know, eight years out. So. Um, as I showed you, the forecast for renewable fuels is robust. California is oversupplied, and that fuel is looking for a market to come to. As a port town, we're an attractive national, uh, natural advantage to bring in this fuel. So in a conversation with Philip 66, they said that um, Union 76 stations in California are selling renewable diesel at the same price per gallon as petroleum diesel. Um, we've heard the same concerns when we passed the RFS the first time. The market gets concerned at first, and then it adjusts, and then it finds a way. And we think that will happen. It happened in California. It happened here. And we expect it to happen here again. Um, but again, managing for that uncertainty through the TAC. Next slide, please. Before we really delve into the implementation schedule, I just want to touch a little bit on air quality because BPS did commission some research here. Um, we had Eastern Research Group conduct an impact assessment. Um, and the point was to quantify the effect of renewable fuels on four different pollutants. And this is really deep beyond my knowledge base, but these pollutants matter for a variety of reasons. Some are ozone precursors. Some are, as you know, PM 2.5 with really drastic health impacts. So, um, we don't know because our standard is really fuel neutral. We're not um, prescribing what blends retailers are going to sell. It was hard to know exactly what blends to model. So we chose two scenarios, an R99 scenario, because we know that's our, our, our end goal, and then a blend of R79 and B20. And really what I want to highlight here is that we see some potentially very big reductions in PM 2.5. And this has been a really vexing problem for Portland and for Oregon. And um, we have someone to speak to this later. Um, and it especially, as I mentioned, impacts communities that live close to construction areas, freeways, and freight routes. So um, 
we see reductions almost across the board in a lot of these compounds, so we know that there will be a positive effect from the renewable fuel standard. And um, on PM 2.5, that, that comes into effect almost immediately. So there's an immediate benefit from the renewable fuel standard. Next slide, please. So this is uh, a little bit about implementation. We have some rules. Um, and then we have this technical advisory committee. So during 2023, we expect to um, have a short-term rulemaking advisory committee that will be broad in its interest. It will have full fuel producers, suppliers, state and local fuel experts, economists, community members to help us write the rules in a short amount of time. And it will address, or shorter amount of time, and it will address definitions and labeling, reporting, and compliance mechanisms. Um, the Technical Advisory Committee um, will also be established in 2023, but it has a longer term charter. It goes through the life of the policy, um, and it has a narrower focus on supply, cost, and carbon intensity. We expect some of the folks who are involved in the rulemaking to um, continue their um, service on the Technical Advisory Committee, uh, but they really do have different charges. And the main, really the, the crux of what the TAC does is advises the BPS director on the use of interim rule authority. So if things are evolving in the market in a way that are not favorable, we have the, um, the director has the authority to change or suspend or modify the policy and the rules. I just want to note that um, we actually, this mechanism works. Um, we've had the interim rule authority in the code since 2006, and the bureau director used it twice to change the mandate from, um, or at least once, sorry, um, to change the mandate from B10 to B5 in 2009. There were some early technical concerns. So we, it has a proven track record of being responsive. Next slide, please. So on this slide, there's three main things happening. In blue, you see um, actions that the TAC is going to take. The red are the policy effective dates. And the green um, are when BPS report to council. So we're going to stand up that TAC in, by the middle of 2023. Um, the May 15th, 2024 um, is the first policy effective date. We did not feel the need for the TAC to have a role in advising BPS on that because we are at currently, as I mentioned, 11% biodiesel today. Um, and we have been told there is ample supply of biodiesel at low carbon intensity. So we did not feel that it was important to, uh, that that standard is, it's kind of a gimme. It's not like that difficult to meet is why we set it up this way. So the first real deadline for the TAC is October 15th of 2025. And then BPS would report to council to so file a report in February of 2026. And then this first real big jump happens in mid-May of 2026 with that 50% blending requirement. And then the cycle sort of repeats itself in 2029 in advance of the 2030 99% uh, blending requirement. Next slide, please. Finally, just to review a little bit of the process, how we got to this moment. Um, it has been going on for a couple of years. Um, in January of 2020, City Council did adopt an ordinance that explicitly um, moved the authority of the RFS to the BPS director to establish revise as necessary and enforce standards for biofuel sold in the city. So we went to work uh, with research and due diligence, monitoring state legislative efforts. We had a large workshop where we talked to producers and suppliers and really informed a policy concept. And then we um, also offered a series of educational videos with follow-up interviews. And um, that was hosted for local community-based and environmental justice organizations. Then beginning in September, we moved into our public comment period. It lasted for five weeks. We held two formal online public meetings. We also offered 10 hours in, of informal drop-in office hours. So that gave folks um, time for deeper conversation and questions. And we responded to over a dozen requests for individual stakeholder meetings. Then we also conducted an additional Ask Me Anything style meeting with community-based organizations. At this time, written testimony is still open through the end of this week. It will close at 5 p.m. on Friday, November 18th. So that is the end of my presentation. Um, we do have some in, um, invited panelists. I don't know if we stop for questions or just keep going. 
Okay, commissioners, would you, do you have any questions about the presentation before we um, invite our guests to speak? Well, why don't we let the guests go ahead and speak in case they have other obligations this afternoon? Great. And uh, then, then I'll have a couple of questions. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so all of our um, invited panelists are on Zoom, so I'm gonna invite our first panelist, Eric Chittable from our City Fleet Department to speak. Hey, Eric. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, Mr. Mayor and members of the council, thank you all for having me. It is a, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, my name is Eric Chittable, and I am the Garage Operations Supervisor with City Fleet. Uh, I started my tenure with City Fleet in the city of Portland 11 years ago, uh, actually on November 3rd, as a vehicle and equipment mechanic. Uh, and through the years, I've been fortunate enough to be promoted into the vehicle and equipment supervisor role, uh, and now where I'm at as the garage operations supervisor. Uh, through my roles, I've seen our progression towards R99 and the effects that it has had on our maintenance with, within the city of Portland's fleet. Um, I'm hoping today to give you a general overview of the maintenance efficiencies we have seen with our equipment with the use of R99. Uh, first off, I believe it would be helpful to give you insight of how manufacturers and OEMs uh, view and recommend getting peak performance out of uh, the after treatment systems that they create, uh, which these can be affected by the fuel types. Um, it's a fairly easy concept, uh, drive it. Often these after treatment systems see less problems when they are driven at highway speeds for long distances. Um, they're not meant for short stints. Uh, it gives the vehicle the opportunity to clean its emission system out in a process that they call active regen. Um, that's when all the soot and particulate matter is heated up into a more desirable byproduct. Uh, with the many crews for various bureaus that operate these vehicles, uh, the job they are doing does not really allow for these types of driving conditions. Um, and oftentimes they're operating on side streets, they're, they're driving for short stints, they're not going too far away from the lots that they came from. Um, and it doesn't allow the after treatment system to kind of really operate as design. Uh, so fuel is a major component to these after treatment systems. Uh, operating efficiently, as well as the, the, their vehicle fuel system in itself. Uh, in 2015, I was still a mechanic on the shop floor when R99 was introduced into the fleet. Uh, I remember there being a lot of hesitation among us mechanics as our main concern would be the effects it would have on performance and maintenance uh, to the after treatment devices and the fuel systems that vehicles are equipped with. Um, through the years, I've personally seen fuel play a part in clogging fuel filters, uh, contaminating fuel tanks through algae growth, uh, and really wreaking havoc on fuel delivery systems. Um, at City Fleet, one of our, one of our main priorities uh, is to keep critical bureau vehicles and equipment uh, fully mission capable so that the crews can kind of complete the important work that is being done on a daily basis. Uh, so introducing a new fuel that would increase maintenance and equipment downtime uh, was definitely concerning for us. Uh, I'm happy to report that after running a blend of R99 and B5 for the past seven years, we have kind of we have seen less issues with vehicle after treatment devices uh, and less issues with fuel system uh, contaminations. We are spending less time repairing issues. Um, which increases vehicle availability for the bureaus, which is really a win-win scenario uh, and really what everyone wants. Uh, so to kind of conclude, we are, we are satisfied with our results utilizing R99 uh, and we'll continue to recommend its use with more constant supply. So that's really all I have um, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Our next speaker. I have to turn my mic on, sorry. Thank you, Eric. Our next speaker is Alan Lado from TriMet. Great, thank you, uh, Mayor Wheeler and commissioners. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. I'm Alan Lato, Director of Business Planning and Asset Management at TriMet. I also coordinate our sustainability team, which is why I'm here today. First, I wanted to start out with the important reminder that regardless of what fuel we use, transit does help reduce greenhouse gas uh, emissions. We offer a lower carbon travel alternative, even when we're using petroleum diesel. Our service and projects support walking, biking, and less driving. They also encourage developing housing, jobs, businesses, and services closer to each other, leading to less driving and shorter trips. And all of this significantly reduces greenhouse gas emissions. 
Looking back more than a century, old streetcars served Portland neighborhoods, and because of the development around those streetcars, those streets today are some of the most walkable retail and housing corridors in the city. And today and in the future, activity and development around our frequent service bus, our MAX stations, and around the modern streetcar all support life with lower carbon emissions. In fact, a recently uh, published study estimated that the emissions reductions from efficiencies in land use and development reduces carbon emissions by six times more than is emitted to provide the service, even with plain old petroleum diesel. But we at TriMet saw that we could do a lot more with our direct emissions as well. Uh, I think you all know we are working hard toward our long-term goal of zero emissions buses with battery electric buses and perhaps using also hydrogen fuel cell electric buses for our longer schedule blocks. But our buses last for 16 years and even more, and we own almost 700 of them, and they're not cheap. It will take time for us to make that transition. So we wanted something that would reduce our emissions now, and for TriMet, Renewable diesel R99 is a good interim solution. We pay a small additional price, but we see big benefits in reduced emissions. The R99 substantially reduced our estimated direct operational greenhouse gas emissions. That together with renewable electricity, R99 has helped to reduce our direct emissions by almost 70% in the last year and a half. Uh, before using it, we tested our 99 in our fixed route buses and uh, to make sure it was reliable. And now we've been using it consistently since last year, finding some of the same benefits that Eric talked about in his fleet. A little later, we were able to start using R99 in our diesel paratransit lift vehicles. And finally, on West commuter rail, we also have started using R99 with no problems and no modifications. We have our long-term plan for transition to zero emission buses, but it can't happen overnight and we know the crisis is here. So R99 has been a good uh, interim solution for our near-term emissions reductions. And the more supply there is, the more that others in Portland and our region can see the same kinds of benefits that we have. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Our next invited speaker is Shelby Neal from Darling Ingredients. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler, Commissioner Rubio, and commissioners. Uh, for the record, my name is Shelby Neal. I serve as the Vice President of Renewables and Energy Policy at Darling Ingredients. I'm here today to provide you with the perspective of a producer of renewable fuels and a producer of low-carbon feedstocks. Darling Ingredients is one of the largest collectors and processors of low-carbon feedstocks in the world. We collect used cooking oil and processed waste animal fats throughout North America. Locally and regionally, we collect used cooking oil from restaurants and we collect waste fats from grocery stores and butcher shops. This material is aggregated for processing at a regional facility located in Portland, which is where our drivers and service technicians are based. In addition to feedstock collection and refining, Darling owns 50% of a renewable diesel business called Diamond Green Diesel. Diamond Green operates 760 million gallons of production near New Orleans, Louisiana, as well as a 550 million gallon plant near Houston, Texas that will come online in Q1 of 2023. Diamond Green has applied for renewable diesel pathways under the Oregon Clean Fuels Program and expects to receive those during Q1 of 2023. It's my understanding that some stakeholders have raised concerns about the price and supply of renewable diesel. Uh, certainly, this is almost always the case when a new program comes up for consideration. But in terms of price, um, while federal antitrust laws um, prohibit me from discussing that specifically, clearly staff and, and Philip 66 are correct in that once scale is achieved, biodiesel and renewable diesel are priced under the price of petroleum diesel. If this weren't the case, you wouldn't see truck stops and wholesalers purchasing the product particularly the scale you see in California and some other states. In addition, I would say that supply is not an issue either. During the first half of this year, California's diesel pool was comprised of 47% biodiesel and renewable diesel. That means out of a diesel pool of something like 3.8 billion gallons, 47% of that was renewable diesel. Many truck stops in California no longer sell petroleum products. This is unbelievable, frankly. I've been involved in California policy since at least 2008. 
And all of the same arguments have been made about supply there. And you can see how the market has responded. More specifically, Diamond Green Diesel is bringing 550 million gallons of renewable diesel capacity online in January. That's just one company. There are several other companies that will also be bringing major capacity online in 2023 and 2024. And if you're interested in those specifics, staff mentioned EIA report, and you can see by company and location that more than 2 billion gallons of new capacity are scheduled to come online in the next two years. So we want to do business in Portland and in Oregon. That's why we've applied for pathways. We plan to bring fresh competition to the market. The California market, as Stev mentioned, is mature, which provides a wonderful success story, but the clean fuels industry needs new markets with robust growth opportunities. This policy helps open that door. An interesting and, in my view, important market signal Portland is sending with this policy is the carbon intensity standard. The 40 CI threshold simply means that Portland is signaling it wants fuels made from the most sustainable, lowest carbon feedstocks, such as waste animal fats and used cooking oil. This carbon intensity creates a hurdle that will help drive innovation in the market, and we believe the market will respond. We see in the record that some have expressed concerns about the CI standard limiting supply of an already limited product. Let me just say that Diamond Green Diesel, while only one company, this is one company that will very soon be producing 1.2 billion gallons of renewable diesel, the vast majority of which will be waste-based. We simply do not see a problem with supply for the Portland market at the CI standard proposed in the code. I reviewed the original proposal from BPS staff and maintained that timeline is entirely achievable. In fact, the entire requirement in 2030, the entire requirement in 2030 represents only 10% of Diamond Green's production. From our perspective, the longer runway to 99% is unnecessary. We're glad to see that the proposed ordinance would allow the director of BPS, the rulemaking authority to accelerate the timeline if it becomes clear that supply is sufficient. We're glad to see the city of Portland taking this leadership role and appreciate the opportunity to share our thoughts with you today. We support the RFS and hope you'll adopt the proposed code amendments. Thank you again for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Andrew Dyke from Eco Northwest Consulting. <laughs> Andrew, can you hear us? Okay. I don't think we're, um, Andrew, we're not hearing you. Kevin Downing, are you on? Can you pop in? Yes, I am. Oh. Okay. Kevin, um, go ahead and introduce yourself. Great. My name is Kevin Downing. I live in Southeast Portland, and weirdly enough, I'm I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk to you once more time about diesel emissions. Now retired, I worked at Oregon DEQ for 26 years, the last 18 as organizer and coordinator of state's efforts to voluntarily reduce emissions impacts from diesel engines, which is a difficult assignment since there is no standard business case for any vehicle owner to reduce emissions. Although the social cost is estimated at $5 per gallon. Diesel engines are the most efficient internal combustion engine. They are widely used because of their power, durability, and reliability. They are heavily integrated into American commerce with more than 95% of freight movement powered by a diesel engine. Oregon, interestingly enough, consumes diesel fuel at higher rates than in Washington or California, considering either population or GDP. Disproportionate is an apt term describing diesel in America. Medium and heavy duty trucks make up about 4% of the motor vehicle fleet, but consume 26% of the motor vehicle fuel and emit 29% of motor vehicle CO2 emissions with an even larger impact to climate from the black carbon soot of the exhaust. Disproportionate also in pollution impacts. In Oregon, highway diesels emit 65% of the fine particulate from all motor vehicles. It is commonly accepted that diesel exhaust is a social nuisance due to the smoke and odor. However, the shoe drops hard when the range of known and likely health effects is revealed, including cancer, heart disease, asthma, COPD, and even impacts to the nervous system. It is a pernicious pollutant with the extremely small size of the particles and its accumulated toxins able to effectively penetrate the body's defenses, 
Most poignantly, a recent report detected black carbon particles on the fetal side of placentas. This in women exposed to concentrations lower than observed in Multnomah County. While the latest bottled diesel vehicles and non-road equipment are 95% lower emitting compared to so-called legacy engines, turnover is slow because of continued usefulness for the older vehicles and equipment and the capital cost of replacement, particularly for financially constrained businesses. Seeing 30 to 40 year old engines in day-to-day -day service is not unusual. For whatever reason, turnover in Oregon has been historically slower than EPA projections. Renewable diesel plays a key role in reducing these hard to achieve emissions in these older vehicles and equipment, while at the same time enhancing further reductions in vehicles and equipment with modern sophisticated emission controls. A report commissioned by the city from Eastern Research Group, a nationally recognized air quality consulting firm, projects a 28% reduction in fine particulate matter from Portland area diesel vehicles and equipment, along with reductions in toxic hydrocarbons and nitrogen oxides with an R99 renewable diesel standard especially in the older engines where impact on climate is two to three times greater from the black carbon than the CO2 also emitted, renewable diesel secures environmental and health protections that are economically efficient and otherwise are very difficult to achieve. Renewable diesel is not a golden ticket, but it is a vital strategy to complement ongoing efforts to protect public health and climate. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. I'm gonna give Andrew another chance if Andrew's on the line. All right, I don't think so. All right, Victoria Paycar from Climate Solutions. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler and members of the commission. Uh, for the record, my name is Victoria Paycar and I'm the Oregon Transportation Policy Manager at Climate Solutions and we're a regional nonprofit working to accelerate clean energy solutions to the climate crisis. I'm here today to voice our support for the city's renewable fuel standard code update. Every year in Oregon, diesel engine exhaust is responsible for an estimated 176 premature deaths, 25,910 lost work days, and annual cost from exposure of 3.5 billion. Oregonians pay for the damage from air toxics through the medical and hospital bills, costly medicine, and missed days of work or school that comes with worse uh, health from breathing dirty air, as Kevin shared. These effects are disproportionately experienced by BIPOC and low-income Oregonians who live in and around high pollution zones due to historic and institutional racist policies and practices. While Climate Solutions strongly supports policies to get us off fossil fuels as quickly as possible and accelerate electrification in the light, medium, and heavy-duty markets, we also recognize that this transformation takes time. While electrification of these vehicles and its infrastructure has already begun, we're also looking at opportunities to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and improve air quality while the transition to a fossil free future takes place. Science says we need bigger and bolder climate policies year after year to avoid the worst climate impacts, meaning we must do everything we can to ensure pollution reductions happen at the pace and scale necessary. For us, this is where we see that renewable diesel has an important transitional role to play. When renewable diesel standards are paired with a decarbonization target that will ensure we electrify our transportation system, we're able to adopt a yes and approach to further reduce greenhouse gas emissions and improve air quality. TriMet's testimony today and their story of transitioning to an electric, uh, all electric transportation system is a great example of this both and solution. While we would have liked to see the renewable fuels phase in be adopted at a quicker timeline, we wanted to show support that the um, of the proposals set carbon intensity with a standard of 40. This not only aligns with the state's clean fuels program, but also will help exclude most biofuels made directly from agricultural products and instead favoring reused and recycled products with lower life cycle carbon emissions and help make improvements to the air we breathe. The unfortunate reality is that diesel engines still make up the overwhelming majority of the trucks and buses on the road. And in the meantime, Oregon's transportation sector is responsible for nearly 40% of our state's total climate pollution and much of the air pollution that's harming our lungs and health, especially within environmental justice communities. Portland's proposed RFS provides a crucial opportunity to maximize air pollution and emissions reductions while keeping the goal of electrification as the unwavering objective of the transportation sector. 
thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Victoria. I think that ends our invited panelists. So we can now open it for public testimony. Very good. No Colleagues, questions. is there any questions before we get to public testimony? We've completed the invited testimony. Uh, how many folks do we have signed up? Ten individuals. Ten. Okay, well, that's only half an hour. Why don't we wait till, uh, can we wait till after the testimony and then we'll have Q&A because undoubtedly testimony will raise some questions as well. Good. And Commissioner Hardesty is virtual today, is that correct? I, I see her on here. Yeah, she's here, right? She's she's in the meeting. Yes, yeah, she said here when her name was called. Oh, great. Okay. Um, she'll let me know if she has any questions. Uh, why don't we start with public testimony, and you'll be called up by our amazing council clerk in the order in which you're signed up, and uh, I'll turn it over to her. Three minutes each. Name for the record, please. First up, we have Greg Pedden, followed by Holly Johnson and John Isaacs. Mr. Mayor, good to see you. One more. Is this your slide? What am I looking at? You this is be yours. Able to, be able to put something up. Okay, great. He, oh, right. It. Oh yeah, that's that's kind of small, isn't it? Okay, well I'll do my best to explain. I was gonna say that. your eyes are much better than no, mine. No, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. My name is Greg Peden. Uh, I'm a lobbyist uh, here on behalf of the Oregon Fuels Association. Uh, the Fuels Association is the voice in Oregon's uh, in Oregon for locally owned fuel stations, fuel distributors, heating oil providers. Uh, we're at the forefront of environmental stewardship with the industry as the leading suppliers of biodiesel and other low-carbon fuels. Often multi-generational, family-owned businesses, the Fuels Association uh, fuels Oregon's uh, economy pro by providing career opportunities to thousands of employees across the state. The association is a leading advocate for common sense regulations that balance affordable fuels and environmental uh, stewardship. We're here today to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Uh, we certainly appreciate all the work that has gone into uh, the, the ordinance and all the work that uh, the staff and, and, and others have done to bring it uh, to where it is today. Uh, we supply low carbon fuels uh, into the market today and will certainly continue to, to do so. Um, there is one problem that we have with the ordinance that I wanted to highlight today, and that is the carbon intensity standard. Um, and uh, uh, folks have touched on this, but the, the detail is really important to us. Uh, the ordinance states that all fuels sold under uh, the standard uh, uh, starting in 2024 must meet the standard of, of 40. We're not all at all confident uh, that that's possible. And here's why, uh, as I'm sure you all understand, uh, fuel is a commodity. And like any commodity, uh, probably on a daily basis, the price, the supply, the quality, et cetera, uh, change. And while uh, there are days where we can supply uh, a fuel with a CI of 15, there are also days where we uh, can only get uh, a CI of maybe 50 uh, that is higher. Um, and uh, that's where we run uh, 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 into a problem here, which is um, we think that on day one of the passage of this ordinance and the effect of, of the effective date of 2024 as it relates to CI, right, the, the blending mechanism has a, has a longer window, but the CI takes effect on, uh, in 2024, we may very well be out of compliance. I certainly understand there's going to be a technical work committee. I, I certainly understand that the, that the uh, Bureau has uh, uh, pledged to, to work with folks, but, and we respect that. We want to participate in that and continue to work on them. Like I said, we want to be part of the, the solution here. But what happens when we're out of compliance on day one? Um, that's the piece that we just feel like there is a little bit of, um, there needs to be a little bit stronger flexibility put into uh, the ordinance. It's not achievable yet. We think it will be. Um, uh, uh, soon, and that's what I, I, I the, the graph that is in front of you, I don't know if everybody in the room can really see it, and I apologize for that, but what I want to draw your attention to is to the, to the second box 
uh, on the what would be the right hand side of the top of the document. Uh, it shows you the breakdown of the average CI scores. Uh, this is from DEQ, I should have said. These are DEQ's numbers, not my numbers. And it shows you right there, uh, this is 2021 by quarter, the biodiesel averages, 43.25, 44.9, excuse me, 40.49, 41, et cetera. You get the point. And so you can understand that being the average, there are days when it's lower, there are days when it's higher. Now, so, so Greg, can, can yeah. I ask you a question? And, and I think your time is up. I, we okay, lost sure. somewhere. We lost the timer. That's that, okay. That I think happens. I'm probably but, made but my point. Look, I, I wanted to ask you this follow-up question while you're you're on the dais anyway. So, um, if, if let me spit back what you're saying to make sure I understood it. Sure. In terms of the mixture, you're saying it fluctuates from day to day. Your concern is the technology may not ramp up quickly enough to create the supply that comports with the standard that would be established under this ordinance. Is, is that a fair statement of yes. what you're saying? So can I ask you a question? So we, we had staff give the example of California and something similar to this being done in California. It, it appears, if I understood the staff presentation correctly, that they have solved this problem. Why are they able to solve it? And your supposition is we would not be able to. Well, I can't speak to what the rules are in California or what the penalties are in California for not complying. Okay, what I can tell you fair. is, what I, as I read the ordinance as it's written, okay. if on January 1, 2024, you are not supplying a CI score of under 40, you are out of compliance with this ordinance and subject to penalties, financial penalties. Okay. And that's the piece where we're saying, you, uh, we can tell you that, given what I'm just showing you here about the fluctuations, that that's going to happen. And it's going to happen because we can't get the supply, not because we don't want to comply. And, and could you just help me understand, I, I, I promise everybody else who's testifying, I, I won't, you know, I, I've, I've known Greg for a while, so I, I feel like I can take a few liberties with him and ask him his perspective on these questions. So, um, w you know, supply obviously comes from outside of the state of Oregon. What, what are the determining factors with regard to supply, in your opinion? Yeah, uh, that's an excellent question. The, in my opinion, you've got uh, market conditions that will affect the supply into this state. So, for example, the uh, demand into California is enormous, right? Let's just, by, by way of simplistic comparison, we have 4 million people, they have almost 50 million people. So just, just as a way of analysis, their, their demand for fuel uh, in these markets is gonna be tremendous. The second piece that's not really talked about here is carbon credits. As you sell carbon credits into, into the state of Oregon or state of California or eventually other states, those carbon credit prices are gonna fluctuate as well. And so, so you have supply, demand, and price, right? And those are the challenges that we'll face. I'm not saying we won't be able to increase supply. I suspect we will because as other folks have said, our supply overall is going to, to, uh, is going to uh, escalate. But uh, just like in any other product, you're gonna go where the greatest demand is and where the price is the best. Okay, and and, and I, I, I won't belabor this more, but maybe I'll say that I, I would personally like more information on the economics of this question to the degree that you can supply it to Absolutely. me or supply it to my colleagues after the fact. I would be interested in getting your perspective. I'm particularly interested in profit margins and I'd like to know something about the overall percentage of, uh, you're an association, correct? So your association membership, I'd like to, to understand what percentage of their sales this would represent. Are we tar talking about relatively large or relatively small? If, if I could get any information you have on that, I would be most appreciative. You bet. Great. Thank you. For okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Next, we have Holly Johnson. Welcome. Good afternoon. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Loud and clear. Great. Hi. I'm Holly Johnson, and I represent Western States Petroleum Association. WISPA has provided council with comments on November 11th, and I hope you have had time or will spend some time reviewing these comments as it will further provide some context to what I'm about to say today. I'd like to start first by thanking BPS staff for the work they've done with the proposed code. 
and the recognition of a modest phase transition time to help with the logistical elements of the program. I want to also recognize WISPA supports all products, including renewable fuels, as many of our members already provide renewable fuels, not to mention other lower, lower carbon products. They are, in fact, investing billions of dollars in technologies to address our future transportation energy needs. For example, both Marathon and Phillips 66 are currently permitting renewable diesel plants in California. The two plants are similar in size, but Phillips 66 plant, if it is built, will be the largest renewable diesel facility in the world. However, we do have concerns with what we believe are program flaws with the current proposal. Our first concern, which has been expressed earlier today, is a limitation on the carbon intensity of the CI number of 40. A 40 CI could limit many bio and renewable diesel products that are already on the market today. And according to DEQ data, which you've seen um, from the previous speaker, only 1% of fuel supplied to Oregon were renewable diesel, and the combined renewable diesel and biodiesel, or excuse me, renewable and biodiesel combined were 10%. According to DEQ data, which you've also seen, all four quarters, these fuels exceeded 40 CI. In some quarters, barely, but they did exceed. Over time, the volume of renewable diesel could reasonably be expected to increase as more projects come online. But as projects come online, so does the demand for these products constraining an already limited supply. As you mentioned earlier today, California, Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia are all vying for the same limited product, and a 40 CI will likely only make it more difficult for Portland. If Portland does feel compelled to include its own CI number, it could start with a CI limit of 65 and then move to 50 and ultimately 40. This approach would allow for more most biofuels available today to be used while recognizing the expectation of lower CI fuel options. And I want to note that a renewable diesel molecule of 60 or 50 or 40 are the same molecule. The emissions, the emissions of that molecule essentially are no different. And I want to say that again. I know I only have a few minutes left, but a renewable diesel mo molecule of a 60 CI, 50 CI, or 40 CI are the same and the local emissions are essentially no different. We also believe that the issues with limited supply and significant to the program that the council should have some oversight to this program. Again, our comment letter provides a much more in-depth explanation of these issues, and we hope the council will spend some time to fully understand those issues and, a and ask us any questions that may help be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. And I, I, I want to ask you the same question I asked Mr. Payton, just because I, I I'm interested in the hydraulics of this. Um, do you know, and I'm probably putting you in an unfair position, um, you do not represent California, I don't think. Um, and if, if you do, please let me know. But uh, again, it, it, my understanding is that this is already in process in California. What do we know about the supply situation there? I, I haven't heard anything about a constrained supply. Yeah, and I, uh, WISPA does represent California, but I myself only represent the Northwest. Um, there might be additional panelists um, on later that could answer that question, but I'd be more than happy to provide additional information about the supply of um, the product in California and if it's required to have a lower CI, which I, I'm i not sure that that's the, the, the case but yeah, I can, and that's, and I that's, can double check that yeah and I, I put you on the spot there and that's not really fair but I, I just thought maybe off <laughs> oh, the, okay. the top and, and we can look that up I'll, I'll ask our staff to do that you don't have to do that in, unless somebody okay. wants to thank you appreciate it okay. thank you next we have John Isaacs welcome All right. thank you mayor uh, Mayor Wheeler and City Commissioners, uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. My name is John Isaacs, and I am the Vice President of Public Affairs for the Portland Business Alliance, Greater Portland Chamber of Commerce. I prefer he, him pronouns, and I'm a resident of Southeast Portland. On behalf of our 2,100 plus members, I'm here today to express our support and appreciation for the process that produced this updated renewable fuels ordinance. It will be critical that the collaboration and transparent approach that was taken by Director Oliveira and his team continues if this, is, if this new policy is going to be successful, is going to successfully achieve its goals. I want to thank Commissioner Rubio for her leadership, along with Director Oliveira, for the positive work the business organizations you're hearing from today when developing this ordinance. Over the past four years, the Alliance has repeatedly expressed our commitment to partnering with the city in achieving its climate and decarbonization goals. 
We recognize that urgent action must be taken to mitigate the growing impacts of climate change. We also understand that the city cannot and will not achieve its goals without ongoing partnership and collaboration with the private sector. Under Commissioner Rubio and now Director Oliveira's leadership, I believe this council is truly starting to see what can happen when the public and private sectors make a sincere and consistent commitment to work together on climate policy. I ask that you listen carefully to our partners who directly represent the fuels and transportation sectors today. Their knowledge of the economics of the renewable fuels market will be essential to ensuring that this ordinance is implemented in a way that does not cause significant harm to the local economy. There's no disagreement that renewable diesel is the low carbon fuel of the future, but the reality is that today there simply isn't enough supply to meet the standards you are considering, nor will there be in the near future. We greatly appreciate that the ordinance was improved to recognize this constraint. We agree with the Bureau that the city needs to take action to send a signal to the market that Portland is open for business for low carbon intensity fuels. However, Portland isn't a large enough economy on our own to go it alone, especially when the rest of the Portland metro region won't have these policies in place. It will be critical for Portland to do everything it can to keep this policy aligned as closely as possible with the state of Oregon and other major regional markets like Seattle or California if it truly wants to meet these benchmarks. Additionally, it will be critical that the city could continue to work with, not against, the fuels industry to align all, all other policies necessary, such as permitting, siting, et cetera, to make it as easy and cost effective as possible for low carbon intensity fuels to be available to our market. We do feel heard on this and we greatly appreciate the, that the ordinance establishes a technical advisory committee to collab collaboratively monitor market conditions in future years. And so long as we continue to stay in partnership, we believe this policy can be successful. Lastly, I want to express our appreciation for the genuine cons consideration that has been given to the negative impacts this ordinance could have had on critical local employers. We are satisfied with how these concerns were addressed. Thank you to Commissioner Rubio for her strong leadership and thank you to the council for your time today. Thank you. The next three individuals are Jana Jarvis, Evan Oneto, and Paul Graves. Welcome. Thank you. Let's sit slow. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler, members of the council. I'm Jana Jarvis, president and CEO of the Oregon Trucking Association, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify on this ordinance. While we appreciate that the director and the staff at BPS have reached out to us concerning this, our position is that this proposal is not quite ready for adoption. And I would also mention to you that I have submitted some detailed written testimony. I hope you'll take time to take a look at it. But I'm going to try to touch on the key points in the time allowed to me. I think it can't go without uh, being mentioned that the trucking industry has been under extreme working conditions over the past two plus years. COVID shutdowns, work from home efforts worked because the trucking industry continued to deliver your groceries to your store and consumer products to your front door. But our drivers experienced no rest areas, restrooms, or places to eat, and we lost a large number of drivers as the pandemic began. And then as the economy rebounded, we experienced high consumer demand coupled with supply chain issues that made our operations significantly less efficient. The largest costs in a trucking operation are labor and fuel, and both were impacted with significant cost increases and we continue to experience them. Driving up costs for Portland-based carriers will only result in losing those carriers to competition from outside the city or outside the state. OTA has been engaged in policy discussions around carbon for years. Our industry has, has invested significant dollars into purchasing newer, cleaner equipment where the tailpipe emissions in a, in a Class 8 truck today are cleaner than the air in downtown Portland. Today's truck has reduced 97% of the particulate matter. So we are well on our way to investing in what needs to be done for the future. And certainly renewable diesel is part of that discussion. However, while the product is highly desirable, it is simply not available. There are efforts underway as we speak to site a manufacturing facility in Oregon, but DEQ just denied their permit and put the construction of that facility back at minimum another year, if not indefinitely. It also needs to be stated that biodiesel is not a similar product to renewable diesel, which we refer to as a drop-in fuel. Biodiesel gels at cooler temperatures, and that's the reason B20 is only used in warm summer months. 
A standard that would rely on higher blends would result in our trucks being unable to deliver your groceries. But the most important takeaway today is your own emergency ordinance that you're going to be considering that authorizes multi-year price agreements for gasoline and diesel fuel for your own city fleet. The ordinance recognizes the desire to, re to move to renewable diesel, but state that it requires a consistent supply of R99 to do so. Your ordinance is a five-year ordinance, which takes you past the implementation date of this on our members. So I, I would thank you for your time today. I would ask you instead to work with us and help us find some incentives and possibly even site a facility within Portland city limits. And with that, I thank you for your time. Thank you. Evan Oneto. Good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler and commissioners. Evan Oneto on behalf of FedEx Corporation as well as the current chair of the Oregon Trucking Association. On behalf of the 5,000 FedEx team members in and around the Portland area, I'm here to testify in Oregon 978. Well, for any law or regulation proposed it, FedEx publicly committed to its goal to achieve carbon neutrality by 2040. We are an industry leader in both the development and acquisition of new, zero, and near zero fuel technologies. But it is our experience that adequate planning, a thorough study of market availability, and use of incentives help ensure a successful transition to new technologies. We must be careful of mandates that do not adequately consider market constraints on new fuels and vehicles. That is why I'm here to express our concern over Ordinance 978. While we often use renewable diesel when, it, when and where it is available, we fear a mandate such as this could create a bottleneck in supply and drive flight prices up artificially. Further as written, the ordinance appears to lack adequate controls to anticipate or respond to such constraints. We appreciate BPS's optimism about future supplies and hope they're right. Um, no, however, uh, nobody saw, I would point out, nobody saw COVID or the microchip shortage as an issue uh, only a few years ago in terms of vehicle supply. The fuel market, as has already been mentioned, is often volatile, and we fear that by the time the director were made aware of supplier cost or concerns, it may be too late, and the Portland market would be unable to adjust in time. The industry needs flexibility and support as it transitions to new vehicle technologies. We ask that Council consider amendments to this ordinance before its passage so that Portland Trucking and its customers are not unnecessarily hit with price spikes or supply crunches. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, we have Paul Graves. Welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor and members of the commission. My name is Paul Graves. I work for Oak Harbor Freight Lines, a family owned trucking company that's been in the Portland. Uh, it has been in Portland for decades. We employ more than 75 people at our Portland terminal. We're a less than truckload uh, carrier, which is one of the hardest things you can do, which is taking the individual pieces of freight and delivering them to and from uh, businesses and individual households to make sure that the good and gracious people of Portland uh, can get the things that they need when they need them. Uh, I'm testifying with concerns about Ordinance um, 978. Uh, there are plenty of reasons you've heard of, uh, plenty of them from uh, the Trucking Association itself. I want to highlight um, some concerns about justice and equity, especially with uh, how the costs actually get fall when costs of diesel and costs of trucking in general increase. Um, I, again, also share the hope that um, that uh, biofuel uh, reliability and availability is going to be there and that this won't actually increase costs. Um, if it is, then we wouldn't even need this ordinance, which would be wonderful. Um, but if it does increase costs, which I think it very well may, um, the trucking industry is highly fragmented and really competitive and operates on really thin margins. And what that means is that increased costs uh, get passed on pretty regularly to customers. Um, and if you might not think about it too often, but anything you buy in a store, in a grocery store or at Target or anywhere else where you shop, probably got there on a truck. And so any costs to trucking get passed along directly to um, businesses that uh, hire trucking companies, and they get passed along pretty directly to consumers themselves. So increases on uh, the trucking industry fall pretty clearly onto uh, consumers and uh, like any kind of uh, fixed costs, increase in prices tend to fall on those who can least afford them, on the working poor and the low income uh, people in Portland. Uh, I also have concerns that uh, an ordinance like this will favor out of Portland um, trucking companies as opposed to those like, like us who operate proudly in Portland will give them an advantage uh, over uh, companies that operate in Portland and uh, will ultimately undermine the uh, benefits from the program because those companies that operate outside of the um, 
outside of the city will have an advantage and will ultimately do better and will encourage more companies to actually move out of Portland itself, which will undermine the very goal of trying to reduce carbon emissions in the trucking industry. Again, we're, I think it's fair to say that most of us in the trucking industry are committed to the goal of reducing uh, uh, carbon emissions and um, to addressing uh, climate change. We've done a lot to already do that. We're looking forward to continuing working with you. We just have concerns with um, ordinance. Thank you very much. Paul, for Paul could I ask you, this is Mayor, if I could just ask you a question, and, and I'm sorry to keep harping at this, and maybe you don't know the answer to it, which is fine. We'll, we'll, we'll track it down. But um, the, the data set that staff provided at the beginning of the presentation included information from California, which is the only example I can point to at this particular moment that that is comparable. And they indicated that the price at least, and, and staff correct me, the price at the pump is comparable to the typical diesel products. So it's, it's not on that side of the equation where a retailer might lose out do you know anything about the cost side of this to the retailer? Is the margin less, or where 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 is this hitting the supplier from your perspective? I can't tell you about suppliers, about retailers themselves. I can tell you about uh, purchasers of sure. Uh, big, yeah, of that's fine. Like, yeah, like us. Um, California diesel costs are uh, substantially higher than they are across the rest of the country, um, especially compared with non-West Coast states. I can tell you that, um, I, that most trucking companies have a California surcharge that specifically applies to any pieces of freight going into or out of California that is an additional charge just for those because for a whole variety of reasons, it's challenging and expensive to operate in California. Um, again, those costs get passed directly along to consumers and ultimately to um, they fall. They, they have the biggest brunt. But we, 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 that's not what we're talking about, right? We, we don't have that. So that's that's not what. Well, I'm, I'm getting it sort of nod, but. Um, yeah, well, and, and and you certainly, I think we should want to avoid that because those are just directly increasing the cost of living at a time when it's uh, already gone up. So I, I again, we're we're open to. I, I mean, I, I I'm not as studied on the um, retailer. That's or, that's fine, and yeah, and so. and nor, nor nor do you have to be. I was just curious. Thank you. I appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Thank you very very much. The next three individuals are Mark Ventura, Keith Wilson, and Jackie Traeger. Welcome. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. My name is Mark Ventura. I work for Philip 66. You already heard about Philip 66. We supply fuels in the city of Portland and in Oregon and West Coast. We do operate a terminal, product terminal in the city of Portland, as well as we market under the 76 brand. We are also a member of the Western State Petroleum Association and we support the comments that, that you heard earlier from uh, Holly, John, Holly Johnson. So appreciate uh, the work that the uh, Bureau of Planning and Sustainability uh, has done, in, in, especially in order to provide more time for the implementation of this program. We do oppose the 40 CI limit. We believe that is not appropriate. So one answer that I can give to Mayor Wheeler is in California, as far as our retail stations, there is no 40 limit CI that applies. So this, this 40 limit CI is arbitrary. Uh, the state of California, California, uh, California Air Resources Board, as well as Oregon DQ, regulate the CI standard in the state and set a standard ever more stringent every year. The compliance is done on an overall basis for the state, whether it's California or Oregon, there is no standard at a local market. So we believe that's, that's not necessary since Oregon DEQ regulates the CI. And as you heard earlier, there are actually no local air benefits by having a CI of 40 versus 50 or versus 60. There's no air, local air benefits. Um, so we believe that uh, that limit should be removed. If you do want to maintain a limit on the renewable fuel, we suggest using a limit of at least 65. 65 is a number that is in the DEQ regulation for the clean fuel program. It's uh, a number where a uh, new operating facility will be using. And so we believe that would enable more supply. As you saw that chart that was presented earlier, if you cut 
your limit at 40, you're essentially eliminating half of the supply. Lower supply, supply and demand means higher prices for your, your constituents. So appreciate the work that has been done and we'll be willing to work with staff and DTS to help in the rulemaking and especially address this issue with a, with a CI limit. Open to questions. Th thank you, Mark. And, and if you happen to have access to any reports or research that could uh, buttress your testimony, that'd be very helpful to me. If there's somewhere you could steer me towards, uh, you don't have to do it now, but off, off uh, uh, later on, that'd be helpful. Sure, thank you. Next we have Keith Wilson. Hi, Keith. Mr. Mayor, commissioners, Thank you for this opportunity. I do want to, for the record, let uh, the council know that I am chief petitioner on a policy similar that is being considered in the Oregon legislature to take this statewide. So I've been working on that for the last three years. What I do have, and I had given to you earlier, was six slides. I did submit those as testimony. What I'd like to do is give you a visual presentation, and I hope, Mr. Mayor, I can answer some of your questions regarding the financial aspects of California and Oregon as well. The first slide or the photo is a, is a screen. You have that before you, yes. It's just a comparison on what petroleum diesel looks like when it burns and what renewable diesel looks like. We've been talking a lot about emissions and black carbon. So the image on the left is renewable diesel. It's almost void of black carbon emissions. It burns twice as hot as petroleum diesel, which limits the black carbon into our surface poisons or our community. That's the magic. Petroleum diesel, as you can see, the significant soot tail coming off of it, that's because of the cetane. Cetane is like octane when it comes to gasoline. The higher it is, the better the performance is. And with renewable diesel, you get up to 80% reduction in emissions, CO2, and 40% reduction in black carbon. Those really matter when it comes to the maintenance of the equipment. From a financial standpoint, this is a clean energy calculator that I have uh, determined through case study. We're saving about a penny per mile. It's significant when you do millions of miles. This is conservative, it's actually much higher. I'm earning or reducing costs by up to 20 thousand dollars just in my Oregon operations. So I'm using renewable diesel and it's a competitive advantage. Because of this case study, I converted my entire Oregon fleet to renewable diesel and we've been running a very efficient fleet and the operating uh, characteristics have been extraordinary. But I converted to renewable diesel because we weren't meeting our emissions goals. In one day on April 1st of 2020, I reduced my emissions in Oregon 60% in one day. And when you're considering your climate emergency plan, imagine that. I mean, quantum leaps like this do not happen overnight. So now let's talk about the financial cost of renewable diesel. Looking at what Shell Oil is on their annual report, they're going to earn about 38 cents per gallon profit margin. When it comes to renewable diesel, producers earn over $4 profit per gallon. By creating the, the demand in Oregon, we're gonna have the supply chain from around the world focus their ships to Portland. Because you're creating an opportunity where they can reliably sell their product to a larger market rather than a small market. It's supply and demand in its most, most basic sense. The next slide is about production capacity. There's enough supply to meet demand in Oregon and Washington and California on a two to one ratio. And then regarding the clean fuels program, the credit price to Oregon is the highest in North America. It's more so than California. There's an advantage for producers to sell in Oregon over California. I've, I've gone beyond my time. Well, uh, let, let me ask you this, because sure. you're, you're answering the questions that I've, yes. I've taken time from everybody's schedule to, and, and you're answering them. So if, if people wouldn't yeah. mind, could, could I have well, you continue? I do have in one show and tell. You've got the examples of diesel on your desk yes. to give you that visual as well. Okay. Please. Thank, thank you. So, so your case study, if I understand this, because we, we've heard testimony that the, 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 you know, there, there's no local, no local air impact regardless of CI. It sounds like you're disputing that fact. Uh, there's 
local air impact, when you use diesel, it has 40 poisons or 40 toxins it emits. There is 40% reduction in black carbon particulate matter. That is a class one carcinogen. It's a significant benefit to our community, especially communities along transportation corridors. So the answer is that yes, there's a significant benefit to our community shifting from petroleum diesel to renewable diesel. Okay, and then your cost scenario here, I wanna make sure I understand yes. it. So you're saying that the wholesale price whether it's petroleum based or renewable is the same. Is that, is that That correct? is my price. So Mayor Wheeler, when this was taken, my wholesale price was $3.82. I buy, you know, I buy 10,000 gallon increments. So I have a contract. Right. And my contract price for renewable diesel is benchmark at the lowest possible price, what is called the Opus rack. So I pay the same price for renewable as I do petroleum diesel, and, the exact same price. And would, would price. these wholesale prices be generally available to all fleet operators, or do you get some special uh, deal because you're large scale? I'm, I'm a mid-sized carrier, so. Okay, and then, then uh, looking here, there's a number of, it looks like credits. So there's a production, well, no, below, yeah, there's a, a US blenders credit, a US renewable fuel standard, RIN credit, RIN credit, and an Oregon Clean Fuels Program credit. Those right. are credits that all currently exist that would be available. Short-term and long-term credits and only getting stronger. The Clean Fuels Program has just become and moved to 37% CI. Currently it's at 10%. So it's going to triple in the years ahead. Only making the credit that much stronger. And the CI level all the producers are gonna send their lowest CI to Oregon because we pay the highest credit. In other words, the way it works, it's inverse. The lower the CI the product is, the more credit that the Clean Fuels Program is going to give to that producer. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay, yep. Larger subsidy. Absolutely, yeah. So, they have a, so the, the global suppliers have a real incentive to send their nastiest, lowest CI sort of waste stream product to Oregon. Okay, and, and let me ask you one other question. Since you sure. mentioned up front you are an advocate for a statewide approach to this, do you see any conflict between what we're doing here at the <coughs> local level versus what some people, including yourself, are trying to do at the state level? None whatsoever. In fact, one of the gentlemen earlier said that we would like to see an accelerated time timeline. When I heard you were moving it to 2030, I was disheartened because it's really something you could achieve on your earlier timeline, as I see from what I've researched around the nation and world easily. Very good. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Appreciate Thank it. you, Dan. Did you have a question, Commissioner Maps? No, but it's Commissioner Maps. Oh, Rogers. yeah, show and tell. So oh, essentially, Thank you. Thanks if you have a chance, Dan has agreed to take a quick smell. If you would indulge me, just open up the petroleum diesel vial. I, I almost put it in my yeah, coffee, so. so. Just don't drink, yeah, it's like uh, ice cream. Let's, let's smell some ice cream. Hardesty. Dan, oh. What's that uh, with all due respect? Don't, yeah. don't leave just yet. Commissioner Hardesty has a question or a comment. Oh, by all means, take, take a smell of the petroleum diesel. Oh, well, I am it. so sorry I'm missing the opportunity. <laughs> all that. right. Well, if only, Dan, does Dan only have it? You well, have uh, it. Don't, uh, don't worry, Commissioner Mayor. Yours is here. We'll save it for you. Uh, is that the darker colored one? Yeah. Take a you smell of it. Yeah. smell those. Try right, it. Here I go. Did I, you smell it? That's crazy. I, okay. So I greatly yeah. appreciate now, uh so am I on? You're yeah, on but now. Wait yes. for the please, please test save us, Commissioner. <laughs> please go. Uh, thank you. Yeah, that's quite uh, a difference. So, so Commissioner wait, Ryan. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, wait. One person at a time. Commissioner Hardesty, you're up next. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, and thank you uh, for your presentation. Um, and your presentation intrigued me because uh, there used to be a time that Oregon was a climate leader. And I think what I'm taking away from your conversation is if we set the goal high, uh, Oregon will not only achieve that goal, uh, but will also actually incentivize other uh, 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 countries uh, to actually uh, compete against each other to provide uh, Oregon with the, with the clean diesel that we desire. Is, is that an accurate assessment of your presentation? Yes, that is accurate. When we moved to B5 in around 2010, we led the nation. And again, today, you have that opportunity to do it. And 
the users of this product will actually benefit from it in lower operating costs and lower emissions and a safer workplace because you don't have poisons being emitted in their maintenance, the drivers or our communities. It's, it's really quite an extraordinary opportunity. And did I hear that there's a very, like a three percentage point difference between the current DEQ standard and what's being proposed by BPS? I'm so sorry, could you restate that, Commissioner? Uh, yes, uh, so uh, we've been talking about should it be at 30 or 40 or right. uh, 37, and I, so I've heard different people give us different uh, uh, measurement points about what, what, where Oregon should be. And I'm just wondering, based on your national research, if, if there is a magic number that we should be uh, shooting for. I, I, I understand now. So the RFS code update is stating it would be set at a 40 CI. Yes. I don't have and an... Does DEQ currently have it at 37? Is that what I heard you say? Oh, I understand your point. They are moving the clean fuels program to 37%. In other words, okay. they want a 37% emissions reduction by the year 2035, I believe. And so with that, every year... The clean fuels program resets and the cost to hire CI fuels goes higher. So there's a cost of carbon. It's, it's costing carbon, if you will. Right. Um, it's a different program versus what we're talking about with CI, but it does get to the same sort of approach where it's trying to really get CI or clean fuels driven to Oregon. Uh, thank you. I, 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 if you have uh, written information about the studies that you've done, I would really appreciate you uh, forwarding some of that information to my office. Um, and, and I'll just end by saying I agree with you. I think if we set the standard high, uh, Oregon will rise to the occasion because that's normally what we do when we have a high standard we need to meet. So appreciate your testimony today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank so the, you. the last point is, Dan, did you smell a difference between those two fuel types? Was it amazing? It was quite stunning, actually. Quite yeah. stunning. So <laughs> that the paraffin, the real smell in petroleum diesel is pungent. Everyone. There's no smell with renewable diesel. And our mechanics and their spouses absolutely appreciate uh, this clean fuel. Yeah, Thank that, you. That does it was like a scratch and sniff. The, the vintners in instead. Yep, exactly. <laughs> Thank Do you all remember scratch and sniffs? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Harsey, do you have another comment? No, Mayor, I'm good. Sorry. Great. Commissioner Hardesty, we'll save your samples so you too can do the <laughs> stiff, stiff test tomorrow. All right. You're too kind. You're welcome. Next testifier is Jackie Traeger. Welcome, Jackie. Hi, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear, and we can see you. Um, well, hi, Mayor Wheeler and Commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on Portland's Renewable Fuel Standard Update. I'm Jacqueline Traeger, Campaign Manager of Climate and Transportation with the Oregon Environmental Council. OEC is a nonpartisan nonprofit organization that works on behalf of our members across the state to advance innovative, collaborative, and equitable solutions to Oregon's environmental challenges. I'm here to express strong support for the proposed RFS update to replace 99% of petroleum diesel sold in the city with renewable diesel by 2026. Doing so will protect our climate, public health, communities, and local economy. We all felt the direct impact of climate-fueled extreme heat this summer, and across Oregon, at least 14 people died as a result. These climate tragedies underscore the urgent need to reduce the fossil fuel emissions driving climate change. And burning diesel is the fourth largest source of climate pollution in the city of Portland, responsible for 14% of local emissions. The RFS is one of our best near-term tools to reduce this impact. And every year in Oregon, diesel engine exhaust is responsible for an estimated 176 premature deaths 25,910 lost work days, and an annual cost from exposure of $3.5 billion, according to Oregon's Department of Environmental Quality. And these health impacts are felt disproportionately by communities of color and low-income populations who are more likely to live along highways, arterials, and freight corridors. 
I urge you to adopt the proposed amendments to accelerate the increase of renewable fuels and add a carbon intensity standard in line with the DEQ Clean Fuels Program. This will ensure that renewable fuels used in Portland are truly lower carbon across their entire life cycle. While we still have existing diesel engines on the road, we should reduce their impact with renewable fuels, which are cost effective and readily available in Oregon. Updating the RFS is an efficient and effective way to protect health and reduce climate pollution as we transition to a more equitable electric mode of transportation. Thank you so much for your consideration. Thank you. Our final testifier is Mark Fitz. Welcome, Mark. In person, there you are. Thank you very much. Uh, so, by the way, uh, my family owns Star Oil Co. Been in business since 1936 here in Portland. I sat on the Sustainable Development Commission when it proposed and went forward with the first uh, RFS. Um, that being said, I've got an analogy I think that describes what's going on here to help you kind of picture what's going on with our testimony and industry to your staff that I agree with in their intent but don't believe they'll get the result they want. Go back to 1999 and imagine dial-up internet, AOL, Earthlink, streaming video. It's where we are, right? When they talk about how much renewable diesel there is, 700 million gallons, that's the whole country. The GDP of Oregon is around 300, million, uh, three, 300 billion dollars. You've got three trillion in California. It's the investments there. When you go back in the market, to look at what's going on. There are roughly three billion gallons of biodiesel, roughly a billion gallons of renewable diesel in the United States. That is coming primarily from soy. Soy is over 40% CI, so you're blocking most of the feedstock that's gonna come online to provide. There's right now planned about a billion gallons of new production coming online. That's hopeful. These are multi-billion dollar plants. The technology to make renewable diesel is like flipping magic. You are rearranging molecules. We are entering a new era and a new world where you will have low carbon agriculture. That's where this is going. Everything you can imagine can be made, broken down and rebuilt for chemistry, right? This is huge and it's bigger than Oregon. I would say that the arbitrary calendar that we're working with is not the way to go. The original RFS had triggering language. How many millions of gallons are sold and available shows that it's available. You create a flag that if you invest, it will occur, and then you don't put yourself competing against Massachusetts and New York and Pennsylvania and New Mexico and Washington for that same 700 million gallons. So what you're doing, intention's good, but you're basically competing against the world for a product that's like water in the desert. So I'd ask you, please reconsider. Hundreds of companies sell petroleum in Oregon. Only a few of us, me included, actually get access to the renewable diesel to handle it. And it is water in the desert. The city, if you check your purchases, you go through periods where you can't get it. That's gonna be on and off for years. It's a good thing, the product's there, right? It'll keep coming, but right now I'd urge you to consider something different. Multiple people have also said the future is electric, all electric. Well, it's backed up by diesel. And the more you put to balance that grid that is aging, the more we're relying on the generators, like on top of this building that my company will be fueling later this week, right? So be aware, it is a very dangerous game we're playing with when the world's backed up by diesel and you're making it very expensive and complicated to handle. So, thank you. Appreciate it, thank you for your testimony. Thanks for being here. Great, thank you everybody who testified. Any clarifying questions anybody has of staff? I, I've, I've got just, oh, go ahead, Commissioner Hardesty, you go first. Uh, excuse me, Mayor. I was hoping the staff would come and respond to the question around uh, uh, their earlier presentation around uh, using California as an example. Most, most of the testifiers who were not in support of the current plan, uh, actually kind of poked holes in the California. So I'm curious as to what staff thinks about that. Hey, Commissioner Harsey, this is Donnie. Could you um, elaborate a little bit more, please, so we can best address? Uh, yes, well, uh, the question is, uh, the, the model that, uh, Donnie, you, you, your staff presented at the beginning was that we use California as an example when we had a higher standard 
uh, the market adjusted and California was very successful in implementing the, the, the higher standard. Um, and, and that was part of the case being made as to why Oregon should uh, follow that model. Does it make sense now? Yeah, Commissioner, I, I'll, I'll start and, and staff, we can, we can um, tackle this together. I think the, the two things to, to be clear about, Commissioner, there's, there's market drivers in California that are distinct in California, given right. tax credits. Um, and their own, and they own, frankly, the, the way they tax their fuels. So as one of the testifiers alluded to, there's, there's higher price points for, for fuels based on California taxes. So there's just, that's distinct. What isn't distinct, though, is the market driving uh, dynamics of the policy we're putting forward today. It's not because we think that we're hoping that the fuel will be there. We're signaling, and I think one of our, um, our guests uh, alluded to this, that Oregon and Portland, by, you know, by proxy with, with this policy, are seeking renewable diesel at the, at the highest and best standard of CI at 40, right? So essentially we're seeing the production happening and we're saying we're looking for this and given the state's clean fuels program, that's providing the incentive for those higher quality fuels to come in because we're getting a better price at that or the, the suppliers are getting a better price. So same model or same, same intention, different market drivers. Does that make sense? It does, thank you, Th that's helpful. Commissioner Maps. Um, does the state of Oregon currently have a CI standard, and do they plan to move that over time? It, it's not a it's not a standard, Commissioner. It's they they are uh, analyzing the pathways of the fuels coming into the state, as so we're able to see what's coming in. And I wanted to just allude to uh, not allude to address the question about the CI at forty and why the forty was the number we started with. Mm -hmm. um, it's essentially the. The approximation of when we have fuels that are coming in uh, that are using recycled or reused material that's below the 40 and yeah. typically things above 40 are going to be your your virgin products or your or even more extreme versions of that story like uh, products that were grown on deforested land you know somewhere around the planet and so we're essentially saying that 40 is the, the place where Portland wants to be as a climate leader acknowledging the life cycle impacts of the fuel not just the emissions in the city which were absolutely significant reductions by using but also where were the unintended consequences Consequences. Many of you heard about our, our um, evaluation of sustainable consumption and how all the products we use in the city, what are the, the life cycle impacts of those. This is a similar um, uh, way to look at this, this policy. We're not just looking at the combustion in the city, but the life cycle impact of that fuel's you know, origin story. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it does. Uh, one more question, um, which may or may not be in a position to answer. Do you have a sense of what our average CI is for gallons for diesel sold in Portland at this point? Do we have that? Do you want to answer that? Do we have that? Uh, for the record, my name is Kyle Diesner with the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. Okay. Um, I do not have that spreadsheet in front of me, but uh, fossil diesel fuel is just over 100 CI, mm -hmm. and so the standard today is B5, that's 5% biodiesel. So that brings that down, I, I believe it's somewhere around 90, um, but we can certainly send you the exact numbers. Uh, I do wanna um, expand on, on your prior question, which I think is important. The state of Oregon allows all fuels into the state. So there is no limitation based on CI. They have a market-based mechanism uh, where lower CI products get higher credits. And that makes those lower CI products more cost effective in the market. What we're saying for Portland, as we've heard pretty clearly from our stakeholders in the community, that Portlanders value those life cycle emissions. And so that's why we've set that CI at 40 um, to limit uh, the fuel used here to the, to the most environmentally friendly products. Um, and so I just wanted to, to, to clarify that. Uh, that Donnie, go ahead. But, Commissioner, I just want to, uh, thanks Kyle, I appreciate that. The other element here, we had a, a violent graph up at one point during the presentation that shows examples that renewable diesel and other biofuels can come in at a carbon intensity scale similar to petroleum diesel. Mm -hmm. So we actually have to be looking at the true life, you know, life cycle cost, otherwise we're just trading one harmful you know, um, product for another. Uh, got it. Um, let me circle back. I, f I feel like one of the subtexts, um, so it's, it sounds like the state, at a state level, um, Oregon has essentially an incentive system to use cleaner fuels. Here in Portland, um, we are talking about using, basically, I think, establishing a standard. Is that 
kind of correct. Um, and I think if I listen to at least what I heard from the industry folks today and over the course of this discussion, they're saying we should just, uh, we incur, you know, we want to move in this direction, but um, we really think the way to get there is our incentives as opposed to a hard cap. Can you help um, this council just kind of unpack the trade-offs between different approaches to reaching what I, it seems to be pretty clearly a shared goal uh, um, to move towards clean, a set of cleaner fuels? At the state level, we have an incentive space program. Portland's considering sort of uh, mandates. Why is one better than the other? I'm going to try to answer this as thoughtfully as possible, Commissioner. We are in the midst of a climate crisis. We have an extreme burden for our future generations to set in motion clear policies and directives that underscore how serious this emergency is. We're talking about a future state where we're electric and maybe even have flying cars, but the reality is today the best mechanism levers we have to pull are the technologies that we already know are readily available and for when it, when it comes to replacing diesel, that's biofuels. We can absolutely continue to wait for electrification to be the end goal, but in the meantime, we still have emissions in our communities that are harming our families and our, and our, and our my children are out there. I don't, like, I don't like diesel trucks driving by my house. Uh, we also waiting for the industry to show up with, with electrification for our, our, big, our big diesel vehicles. Until that time, and we know it's coming, we need an alternative. And so yes, you're right, there's a lot of pressure points on all of us trying to figure out how to solve for the many things that we're dealing with as a society. But I can tell you that the climate crisis is not going away and Portland is perceived as a leader. We are recognized right now what's happening today in Portland will reverberate across the country. We just hosted the Urban Sustainability Directors Network uh, this week. We had directors all over the country, or the West, West region actually, coming into Portland to talk about what's next on policy. And they're looking to Portland for leadership on these sorts of maneuvers because it sends a signal to the market that these sorts of technologies and policies are real. And it's not just a, a thing we came out of left field on. We, we heard examples from TriMet, our own fleets, that are using RD. And they're saying this is actually not only good for, for the planet, but we're actually seeing operational value out of this as well. So what we're saying is, Commissioner, yes, there are different levels that we can pull, but at this point, we're trying to send a very clear signal that Portland is a leader in climate and working with our industry partners to ensure that when we do do policies, it's benefiting them as well. Thank you. Very good. Commissioner, go ahead. Um, thank you. I, I just have, a, a, if there are no more questions, I just wanted to make sure that we get, uh, or I introduce the amendment change. Please go for it. So I want to make a motion to adopt a proposed amendment, and I don't have the language in front of me. I think it was submitted, but I do have it. Uh, but in, a, in effect, uh, it changes three dates in directives two, three, and four. I don't know if I need to read that into the record or if submitting it. Commissioner, if you could read that into the record, that would be preferable. I think staff is getting the, the language. Here it is. Right Second, sorry, that second paragraph. So, due to an oversight, changes are needed in the council directives. Therefore, I am introducing an amendment to the ordinance. This is necessary because BPL staff made changes to the effective dates in the code in response to feedback from the fuel industry, but neglected to change dates in the ordinance according, accordingly. This amendment changes three dates in directive two, three, and four. So in number two, it, it, it changes uh, the uh, 
month of December to July 31st, 2023. In number three, it changes um, December 31st to October 15th, 2025. And then strike six puts seven months in advance of the May 15, 2026 effective date. Later in that sentence, strike December 31st and put October 15, 2029, and then seven months instead of six um, in advance. Number four, uh, report to city council instead of March 31st, February 15, 2026, and February 15, 2030. I second. We have a motion from Commissioner Rubio. We have a second from Commissioner Hardesty. Is there any further discussion on the yeah. amendment? Commissioner Maps. I, I do. I, I'm, um, I'd like to ask staff to provide an intuitive summary on what's happening with this amendment. Commissioner Maps, uh, just to be frank, when we updated the, the code language for effective dates, we did not uh, make the same changes on the ordinance. So we're truing up the ordinance to be reflective of the changes in the code. All right, thank you. So to be clear, this is a technical amendment and yeah. uh, by voting on the technical amendment, we're updating the draft language. We're obviously not voting on the, yeah, the package no, today. Is there any debates. further discussion on the amendment? Please call the roll. Maps? Aye. Rubio? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Hardesty? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. The amendments now approved. Okay, so any further discussion or questions at this particular juncture? Seeing none, this item moves on to second reading. Keelan, is there a time certain available on the agenda on December 7th? I'm sorry, uh, Megan, I apologize. Yeah, December 7th at 2 p.m. December 7th, 2 p.m. time certain. And uh, I should have asked if anybody else had any amendments today. If not, obvious. Uh, we will have an opportunity to have bureau staff return to introduce amendments on that date, correct? Right. Good. All right. With that, uh, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>